we have sun, nuclear energy, wind power, gas and oil, geothermal energy, coal, fire, and water. So what do these pictures have in common? They have energy. So we're going to have to start our unit to introduction to energy on energy and ATP. What does a plant and these animals have in common? The sun. So let's go ahead and start. In introduction, the objective today is that students know the cycle that ATP goes to ADP and students need to know that there are two forms in how we attain energy. Energy comes from the sunlight. So how is energy obtained? I mean, how are we going to harness the energy from the sun? There are autotrophs, which are usually named producers. Um, most recognizable, they are the ones that have green, you think of the sun, you think of photosynthesis. But there is another type of autotrophs that they also do is through chemosynthesis, which organisms take energy from chemicals, right? And they're usually in places where they're dark and cold, where there is no option of getting energy from the sun, yet since it's dark and cold and they have to do it through chemically wise. Next, we have heterotrophs who are going to be consumers like these cute little penguins here. They cannot get energy from the sun nor just solely chemically. They have to consume other autotrophs and potentially heterotrophs to obtain their energies. So there are two types of autotrophs as I said before. They get their energy through the process of photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. So, what are autotrophs? We look at the word auto and autotrophs, it means to go by itself. And here are some examples. We've got uh, different kinds of plants. Autotrophs or, or organisms that produce and store their own carbon-based energy. For instance, plants have you seen before? This coffee bean plant. This coffee bean plant. We have algae, and this is a microscopic picture of an algae and bacteria. And there's a picture of a uh, believe salmonella bacteria. And I believe that's E. coli. And all three of them together compose about 17 to 20 of the living autotrophic species. Autotrophs are invaluable, which means they're very important. One of the ways that we talked about earlier is that they go through photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, what they do is they mainly produce glucose that is immediately used by the plant. And if they don't use it right away, uh, they can store it as extra food as glucose and fats. And that is why for plant cells, they have an extra organelle with called vacuoles that make that starch. So what is chemosynthesis? Now that we've talked about chemosynthesis, chemosynthesis in definition means to make chemicals. There are hydrovents that let out sulfur glasses as in a primary example. So here is a uh, structure 
that shows the hydro vents with tube worms growing out of it. Well, at first, the basis of this ecological environment is that there are certain types of bacteria that takes the sulfur coming out of these hydro vents in the deep sea and they make that to survive and produce food. Then their massive populations produce these white flakes um, that are inside the tube worms. The tube worms they have a relationship which allows them to grow. Here's an another artist's rendition of the tube worms. Uh, this is in, in a deep sea environment which also allows other species to have form that only lives by these hydro vents in the deep sea. And you can tell this crab here is albino and they have no reason to have any color since they live in the dark and that the bacteria is the basis of this unique community. And they also have other crabs that live nearby as well. So, we come to the second category of um, energy, are heterotrophs, organisms that can not produce their own energy, thus they consume or absorb other organisms. And in some ways you can think that autotrophs are opposites to heterotrophs. They include all animals. You can see this huge and beautiful moose here. Fungi, in other words, mushrooms, if you're not familiar with that word. And protists. Protists are uh, single cell organisms, and in most cases, uh, they give us diseases more than anything else. They're not an advantage. And then, of course, bacteria are also in heterotrophs. So there are certain bacteria that can be autotrophic, um, but most of them are heterotrophic. You can tell this is a still picture of bacteria moving around, and they look different, look like they have tails on them. They're actually their flagellas, uh, which allows them to move around. So in heterotrophs, energy is lost through their waste as potential waste. There also are energy is stored in protein as you can tell protein such as fish, beans, and part of the legume family or meat. The next thing we're going to talk about is ATP and other forms of energy. So you're like, oh, you hear this word all the time. What is ATP? ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. The reason it's called adenosine triphosphate is that um, it's a basic unit energy. They have adenosine, which is the five ring carbon unit attached to the nitrogen in unit. And then they have, as you can tell, one, two, three, three phosphate bonds, and that's a basic unit of energy. It's very important because it's highly efficient, and we're going to go into that in the unit when we talk about how we use ATP in cellular respiration. So as a review, our sun is our main source of energy. Energy is, once we get it from the sun, energy is carried and stored through the form of carbohydrates. Forms of energy is synthesized by autotrophs through the process of chemosynthesis and photosynthesis. Now as you can tell that glucose is decomposed. Once it's made, glucose is a common form of energy stored as a type of carbohydrates. It is decomposed by heterotrophs and autotrophs through the process of cellular respiration. So here are the various forms of energy possible. Glucose and ATP are, has the most potential energy output, and it's very efficient. So here is the chemical form of ATP in its 3D model form. You can tell that the blue rings are the nitrogen, and the triphosphate are the orange and red bonds here. Carbon is always portrayed as the gray bonds in a, a molecular model.
The other forms of energy that trail behind ATP is NADH, NADPH, FADH2. They are in descending order of how much energy they can contribute. Energy are produced in the mitochondria and chlorophyll as a general overview. And ATP is an ideal source energy because the phosphate bond in between each of the bonds, when they de decompose, taken apart, they release a lot of energy. So if you look over here in this adenosine triphosphate, the bonds in between the two phosphates, when it's broken, it releases energy, which in the cellular you can see it producing ATPs in the lecture for cell respiration later on. So how is energy or how is ATP used? Um, in general, they are used for mechanical functions for physical movement for cells in organisms that have flagellum or cilia. So here is a microscopic picture of cilia on an organism. They are used for muscle functions, for movement that way, coarse and fine motor skills. They are also used for cellular regulation to maintain homeostasis in cells. An active transport, it, about 30% of your ATP, which is a lot of energy, are used for regulation of movement of molecules across the membrane. And here is a very common one, it's the sodium potassium movement that transport that is used for muscle movement. And then we also have ATP use in assistance and also for the making of synthesis and decomposition of chemicals, making and breaking down of macromolecules. Synthesis and making, decomposition is, means breaking down. And here's an example of lactose, which is a sugar found in milk breaking down into galactose and glucose and eventually glucose will be put in through glycolysis which is in cellular.